Hi all, welcome back to the Stat Dose podcast. We're here for another Turbo Dose and Matt and I are going to run through some of the essentials uh, that you need to be aware of with regards to a acute exacerbation of COPD and hopefully uh, this Turbo Dose will prepare you better for going into simulation teaching and in your clinical practice. <laughs> COPD is essentially persistent respiratory symptoms due to airflow obstruction that's not fully reversible, which slightly differentiates it from, from asthma where the, the airflow obstruction is largely reversible. COPD again is also progressive, so it's going to get worse with time and it's most commonly due to smoking, although there are other, uh, other toxins have been implicated recently, things around sort of air pollution, some chemical fumes and things like that. So one of the key components that you need to understand when you're seeing these patients with acute exacerbations of their COPD is the concept of respiratory drive. Now, normally in most patients, respiratory drive is largely driven by the CO2 levels in blood. Essentially, the, the acidosis that that causes triggers the medulla to stimulate a respiration. In chronic type 2 respiratory failure patients, including those with advanced COPD, the respiratory centre gets used to such a high level of CO2 that it actually switches to using the mild low-grade hypoxia that these patients have for stimulating respiratory drive. Now the issue there is if you correct hypoxia too quickly, i.e. by giving these patients 50 litres via non rebreathe for, for a prolonged period of time, normally around sort of 20 to 30 minutes, the respiratory centre thinks there's enough oxygen on board, so therefore stops breathing. You essentially have a respiratory arrest, which increases your CO2 further and obviously can be life-threatening. I think one of the key things is to sort of not be petrified of oxygenation. And it's not specifically that if you waft a bit of oxygen near a patient with COPD, that they are going to go into respiratory failure. And, and I think that's important to note because some, sometimes I think the fear factor is there, whereas actually, for the most part, providing supplemental oxygenation and then titrating down as appropriate is is beneficial particularly for these patients that are critically unwell and actually it's more important to oxygenate them you're not going to kill patients by sort of placing them on oxygen for a short period of time whilst giving you a bit of breathing room to, uh, forget the pun breathing room to to think about other things So in the context of an acute exacerbation of COPD, we're looking for the signs of, of chronic COPD, but we're looking for that acute on chronic. So you'll have a new or increased cough, sputum production may be increased, and there may be an increase in your shortness of breath. Alongside that, some of the more subtle um, signs and symptoms may be a, a reduced exercise tolerance. And then, of course, we're going to be looking for signs of uh, a fever to suggest an infective exacerbation, plus or minus pain. And importantly there, we want to be considering chest pain and considering the, the differentials there, but also noting the fact that COPD patients are a, an example of a cohort that are very likely and, and at more risk of getting things like pneumothoraces. Matt, how do you go about assessing these patients? Well, we're going to adopt an ABCD approach again, Joe, as, uh, as you know. Again, just, just working through that, obviously, we've talked about oxygen already. When you're seeing these patients acutely, just put them on at least some oxygen. Just sticking them on a non-rebreathe for five, ten minutes, as you mentioned, isn't going to cause too much harm. Patients are more likely to die from hypoxia than they are from hypercapnia, as, as, as Joe was saying earlier. But once we've worked out whether they're a CO2 retainer or not, we want to target those, those oxygen saturations, titrate them down. So 88 to 92 if they are a CO2 retainer uh, or 94 to 98 um, if they're not. The blood gas wise, so I'm, I'm not particularly keen on doing arterial blood gases in all our patients. Venous gas initially, certainly for these COPD patients, it is enough. If they're acidotic, then you might want to consider doing an arterial blood gas because then that's going to potentially implicate whether you need BiPAP if they're acidotic. So if their pH is less than 7.30, as per the BTS guidelines, you, you're going to consider starting BiPAP there. So most of the pharmacological management of COPD is going to fall into the section of sort of B and C, nebulized salbutamol and nebulized ibuprofen bromide. Antibiotics are given quite liberally in exacerbations of COPD. And then we're going to be thinking along the lines of uh, giving parenteral steroids. One of the most crucial things to have a look at here in terms of investigations is a chest X-ray. 
And as we alluded to previously, it allows us to have a look for pneumothorax, particularly as a um, sign of an increasing shortness of breath. So it might not actually be that this individual is is in a sort of infective exacerbation, but may have new, uh, a pneumothoraces, or it may be both. In terms of chronic care, Matt, when you're sort of discharging these individuals, what are a few things that you think about? You know, education and informing the patients obviously important. Smoking cessation is the only real thing that's going to slow the progression. As I mentioned at the start, CFPD is a progressive disease. There's nothing we can do about that. But if you can stop smoking, that does slow that that curve, um, that downward curve. There are other, other things as well. So there's pulmonary rehab, which is essentially a sort of a combined exercise, education, information service, normally run by sort of CFPD type nurses or respiratory nurses in the community. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just to pull on that point, it's quite interesting because I think there is a culture that suggests that once individuals have got COPD, it's sort of less of a priority to, to actually talk to them about smoking cessation because they're already too far down the line. But I think the reality actually is that there, there is demonstrable evidence of a reduction or, or plateauing of symptomatology with smoking cessation that proves a benefit. And so I think it's really important to continue having that conversation with patients. So just to summarise then some of those key salient points, um, as we mentioned, the pathophysiology of respiratory drive uh, and how it's affected in chronic type 2 respiratory failure is important. Uh, remembering that these patients have a hypoxic drive, so you want to avoid long periods of high oxygenation. Uh, just remembering that acute exacerbations are suggested by either a new or an increased amount of cough, sputum production or shortness of breath, often with a reduced exercise tolerance, and there may be things like a fever or, or some chest pain alongside. When assessing these patients, we want to adopt an ABCDE approach. Our medical therapies include nebulizers, antibiotics and steroids with some targeted oxygen therapy once we've worked out whether they're a CO2 retainer or not. If they're acidotic, we're going to be considering things like BiPAP and early escalation of care. <laughs>